I'd like to ask my co-chair, Vince Cayoso, to pose the questions that he formulated for this session, and then we'll move on to the uh, um, panel discussion. Vince, please come up. And we have the uh, question yeah. slide. Yeah, I guess we want all of our speakers to come on up, don't we? Yeah. First, I think I uh, really uh, want to thank all the speakers for fantastic presentations. Actually, I think in many of the presentations, you've already answered the questions that we had up there. Um, so I think, you know, in terms of the osteocalcin, uh, the issues in terms of the link between genes controlling myogenesis and osteocalcin, we've seen some of that. Uh, I guess. The one thing, the one question I would have, or the one comment I would have, is that as a muscle physiologist, I think for some of the uh, genetically modified animals, maybe more physiological approaches, also ruling out uh, possible behavioral changes that can occur. So, for instance, I think uh, with respect to the osteocalcin animals, it would be interesting to know what happens to their wheel running. Uh, so. You know, are they spontaneously doing less wheel running? Are they doing the same amount of wheel running? Are they doing more wheel running than the wild type animals? I think that might provide some insight in terms of their exercise capacity that you were measuring. Um, you know, just an area to go. Uh, there have been uh, a lot of natural selection type of experiments to look for high performers and low performers done by Ted Garland and come to find out uh, he's got a generation 26, 42. These animals love to run. <laughs> he selected, when he went and did his natural selection, what he basically did is he ended up selecting for a behavior where the animals love to run. Also, there are the marathon, marathon mice uh, that were generated by uh, Dr. Evans down at uh, Salk. And similarly, take a look at their uh, interest in running it seems very high as well. So I think just ruling those things out in terms of how they may be impacting muscle physiology would be important. And don't know if any of you have any comments in that regard, but I think those would be some basic housekeeping types of measurements to make. Yeah, no, so we, what we did was to use the protocol of Ron Evans for running so that we exactly did the same thing. Yeah. I'd, I'd also comment that um, I, I, I realize we're early in the game as far as this crosstalk signaling, but I think we're going to have to focus on what are chronic adaptive changes that are occurring in the muscle bone system versus things that may be occurring acutely in response to a challenge. Uh, and, that, and the pathways may be different. The, uh, the second issue is one that's related to the mitochondria. Uh, uh, for a period of time, we were very blessed at UC Irvine to have Doug Wallace, who's one of the premier mitochondrial biologists in the world. And uh, it was interesting talking to Doug because at one time, mitochondrial biology was incredibly hot, and then it seemed to kind of fade away, and now it seems to have had a reemergence. And uh, I think uh, the question came up earlier in terms of how uh, the osteocalcin may be impacting the mitochondrial capacity of the muscle. And I know that you're early in the studies of um, looking at osteocalcin, but I think in terms of anything related to mitochondrial biogenesis, oxidative stress, things of that sort that may be controlling, I think maybe of... Uh, yeah, so there are a couple of points. First of all, we showed five years ago that there are less mitochondria in, in muscle. That's already published. Yeah. And the oxidative capacity of the mitochondria is decreased. I think we can go in details of mitochondria biology, and we are going into it. But the key question is, what is downstream of osteocalcin and its receptor? Because this is a chronic effect. I mean, to answer Mark, this is not an acute effect, otherwise we will see it at birth. It's something that builds up around, uh, or, uh, and is seen around four or five months. So the key question is, what is a mediator? We are not going to find, I suppose, new genes in mitochondria, 
we are going to find genes that we know are already affected, like PGC1 alpha. But between osteocalcin, its receptor, and PGC1 alpha, there are other genes. And those are the ones we need to look at. The uh, second last one was on uh, possible myokinetic uh, polymorphisms. Really want to thank you for that summary slide that you had uh, looking at the myokinome. That was a, a great slide. And just wonder if you can comment on any potential polymorphic issues or? Um, I, uh, we're actually working at the moment on um, on polymorphisms. Actually, um, Bruce Spiegelman presented some um, data at a keystone that PGC1 in muscle is a truncation mutant that um, that behaves entirely differently. Uh, he's called it PGC1 alpha 4, and and uh, it's a truncation mutant. He presented that at a keystone, and I believe the paper's in press now. But um, the other thing, because IL6 is transcribed, its transcriptional um, uh, signature is completely different. Uh, when you contract the cell as distinct from when you, you, you give the cell hydrogen peroxide, the likelihood uh, that there could be um, different forms of, of IL-6 in muscle uh, is something we're, very, we're working very hard on at the moment. And, and the, the interesting thing there is um, all of the inflammatory effects of IL-6 are due to a process known as transsignaling. So all cells express GP130, not all cells express the IL-6 receptor or the lift receptor. So the IL-6 receptor gets cleaved and then you, uh, you get this process of transsignaling where the IL-6 receptor binds IL-6 and then it can go to any cell because every single cell expresses GP130 in abundance. Now, if there is a truncation mutant that won't bind the, the receptor at that particular um, area of, of, of binding, then this truncation mutant may actually be uh, an anti-inflammatory IL-6. And that's something we're working on because it is a conundrum that you have, you know, IL-6 has this, this positive effect and this negative effect. And, and, and I think that maybe, I mean, teleologically, you wouldn't expect um, exercise to produce something that's really inflammatory. So we're working on that. And I guess the, the last comment goes to you, Jim, in terms of uh, these M2 macrophages. What do you think uh, acts as a signal that to cause uh, M2 macrophage to, to bind to a particular fiber? And do you think they're binding to all injured fibers, or is, there, is it just a random phenomenon? I, I don't. Is this on? I, I don't think that they're binding. Um, I or fusing or... Yeah, yeah. So they're being chemo-attracted into the mu injured muscle. So the more injured the muscle is, uh, the more able it will be to attract um, macrophages. So there are several chemokines that can be released by muscle fibers. We heard MCP1 might be one of them that could would attract monocyte macrophage populations and neutrophils into injured muscle. Once they're there, um, the initial population is phagocytic, so they're removing debris, so that kind of makes teleological sense. And then what appears to happen is that the act of phagocytosis triggers scavenger receptors that once they're engaged, they'll begin the phenotypic switch to M2 that produces an increase in IL-10 expression that then drives it to completion. So the, uh, the initial injury provides the signal to track the muscle or the monocytes into the muscle. Yeah, I guess my question is, do you know that all injured fibers uh, have M2 macrophages that fuse with them? Or? Oh, I don't think that the macrophages fuse at that stage. There's no okay. evidence that they do. Mm -hmm. um, there's low frequency of fusion at the early common myeloid progenitor st stage. Um, what happens when the M2 macrophages are, are finished doing their contribution to regeneration and populations drop back down to normal, um, there's some of it came apoptotic, but whether or not they immigrate from muscle to hasn't been shown. All right. Uh, any questions from the audience at all? Or? Yes. 
I'm Sudhai Gawal from Ohio State. I have a question for Dr. Fabria. The two things, number one, besides mechanical signals being regenerative signals, they are very potent anti-inflammatory signals. Number two, IL-6 injections prior to endotoxin challenge are shown to inhibit uh, endotoxin challenge Correct. by inducing an anti-inflammatory state. Correct. So what is your thought about exercise inducing IL-6 that may in, make the body more resistant okay. to, to infections? Okay, that, that's, that's almost a planted question because we actually published a paper in 2003 <laughs> where we gave humans low-grade endotoxin uh, and we initiated a TNF response. <laughs> then we exercised the patients after low-grade endotoxin and TNF didn't go up. So then we measured the IL-6 during the exercise and did a third experiment where we infused recombinant human IL-6 after endotoxin and TNF didn't go up. So I think the question you're posing is one that exercise is actually very anti-inflammatory because it, it can, it's not, I don't think, just IL-6, but it, it produces um, uh, probably other factors that inhibit um, cytokines. But the other thing that happens with exercise is it primes the immune system, because if you take blood cells out after exercise and stimulate them with LPS, then they mount a much bigger cytokine response. So and exercise is very anti-inflammatory and for the, the people like the presentation today about you know lifestyle intervention, exercise has so many benefits, I think, for many diseases. So it's a good point, thank you. Uh, one more question. <clears throat> so would a pre-exposure uh, to exercise would be better or a post-exposure to exercise after, say, an injury? After, after an injury? Um, well, um, or, or, or after a potential pathogen. Yes. Okay, so after a p pathogen, um, a pre-exposure pre to exercise would probably be a, a good thing because exercise seems to prime the immune system. But of course, too much exercise is then going to depress the immune system. So it's a fine balance. But I would say it's an interesting question. But I would say that exercise would prime uh, the body to deal with uh, foreign matter a bit better. Thank you.